Welcome to Bad Ideas, the show where we look at misfires, mistakes, and miscalculations from all throughout history. I'm Tony Southcott. And I'm Albert Berg, and Tony is going to tell us about a relatively famous, at least in name, bad idea this week. Tony, what do you got for us? Today, we're going to be talking about Charles Ponzi and the origin of basically why it's called a Ponzi scheme. When people think of Ponzi schemes, the first name that comes in their head is probably Bernie Madoff. They remember headlines about billions of dollars being torn from the hands of hardworking people from a supposed financial genius. Uh, It was a scam that lasted 50-some years, and they started hearing the term Ponzi scheme over and over and over again. But a lot of people don't actually know what a Ponzi scheme is. People had pipe dreams that 15% returns, even in a recession, could continue, and this just wasn't the case. Madoff, however, was not the first major perpetrator of the Rob Peter to pay Paul scam in the United States, and he surely wouldn't be the last. In the early 20th century, an Italian immigrant named Charles Ponzi made a scheme so large that this type of fraud would forever bear his name. Ponzi laid out an irresistible offer to his marks, 50% profit on your investment in 45 days. All you had to do was buy a Ponzi note, wait 45 days, come back, and have the massive profits. Most of the initial investors would immediately reinvest this money to get another 50% on top of that, essentially going 100% in 90 days. Well, how does... Wait, 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 wait. So how does the... This sounds pretty good to me, Tony. Where's the bad idea? I want my 100% in 90 days. I give you $100, well, I get $100 back? That That's not a bad idea. Yeah, especially if you're like, hey, I've got $1,000. I could turn this into two by the end of, like... This is... I, that would be about early February or late February now. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Where do I send my money? (laughs) Well, all of this was supposedly funded by international reply coupons that he alone had found a loophole in cashing. I'm not going to pretend to know what an international reply coupon is. Oh, we're going to get there. We're going to get there. Okay. But before, before we get into the incredible scam that Ponzi ran, let's define what a Ponzi scheme actually is. A Ponzi scheme is a fraudulent investing scam promising high rates of return with little risk to investors. A Ponzi scheme generates returns for older investors by acquiring new investors. This is similar to a pyramid scheme in that both are based on using new investors' funds to pay for earlier backers. For both Ponzi schemes and pyramid schemes, eventually there isn't enough money to go around and the schemes unravel. Okay, maybe less of a good idea. I'm going to maybe only give you $5, Tony. It's probably awesome if you're one of those initial early investors, like say you've got ten grand to put up, you get fifteen, and then you just never go back to Ponzi. That'd be a good deal. But the longer these go on, the more and more and more it just starts to falter and starts to fall apart. Like that was part of the reason why uh, Bernie Madoff's scam was so interesting because that went on for around forty years, possibly fifty. I'm trying to remember the exact dates on it, but it was it was from like the. I believe the late 60s, and he actually kept that rolling for that long because he was so successful with it and was able to hide it. But that also felt like a more legitimate scheme because he wasn't offering 50% return in 45 days. It's just an insane number to me. Most of us have had to sit through pitches for a pyramid scheme at some point. We learn about how if we keep recruiting people to work for us, then the returns are nearly limitless. It only takes a small upfront investment, of course, and you'll be able to watch your cash flow I expand with very little effort, and the people working under you will keep making it uh, grow because they'll have a team under them, and so on into infinity. They now go under the moniker of multi-level marketing and account for $30 billion in sales yearly. Yeah, this still happens on a regular basis. I don't think that I've ever personally been pitched for this, but I've been behind people being pitched to this like you just kind of across from them in the restaurant just a little pro tip for you guys just for your lives if someone says to you this is not a pyramid scheme it's a pyramid (laughs) scheme okay because people don't say that about like why don't you invest in my idea that is like for an internet product they say it for pyramid schemes (laughs) yeah with uh with pyramid schemes like they they try to say it's multi-level marketing where you just like but even when they're showing you the chart, it's literally shaped like a pyramid when they say it's not one. And there's a lot of companies that kind of fall into this. Pyramid schemes are illegal in the U.S., so they have to be very careful how they word it. And they have to make sure that they're actually selling something. It's not like a, not like a Ponzi scheme where you're getting a note. Like, you, a lot of times you can get essential oils or things like that. There's a lot of different a lot of uh, types. products that do this yeah. as well. 
a lot of health products, like juices, like all sorts of different things. Like you can find a pyramid scheme for almost anything, even if it's just selling like uh, timeshares and random stuff like that. When they pay out exorbitant rates of interest, it comes from a giant pool of cash from other investors, not from actual yields or actual sales. That's the big difference between a Ponzi and a pyramid scheme. At least with modern pyramid schemes, there is usually a product to show for it, even if most people inside of it end up having a garage filled with stuff they'll never use. And so this is, you can understand kind of how this would work, right? Because you go to the bank, you put your money in the bank. The bank doesn't just put your money in a hole and sit on it. Like it gets invested and moved around and stuff. And when you go to pull it out, you may be able to pull out all your money, but they don't have everybody's money sitting there at the bank. Ponzi just takes that to the next level and says, well, yeah, anytime somebody asks for it, I'll give them the investment that they say that I told them that they were making. But as long as people keep putting money in the pot, then I'll be golden. Yep. And that's uh, that's basically what he was relying on. And the interest rate was so high that most people just wanted to keep rolling over their money so they didn't actually ask to get it out. This brings us back to Charles Ponzi. The charismatic Italian always had massive dreams and delusions of grandeur. He came over from Italy with a fair amount of cash, and then he proceeded to gamble it all away on the boat over to America. When he landed, his life savings had dropped to a mere $2.50. He would later tell the New York Times, I landed in this country with $2.50 in cash and a million in hopes, and those hopes never left me. Fortunately, hope doesn't buy you a house. Also, it seems like he landed with a little bit of dishonesty and... I don't, whatever you would call that in his heart as well. He also he definitely did. Like I uh, back back then, he actually had tried to go legit. Like he'd try to make he tried to make a fair amount of money while he was in Italy. He was trying to find his own way through the world. He was he was still pretty young at the time. I think he was like seventeen whenever he came over here. But if you have someone who's willing to gamble away everything they have in the world on the boat over, that's someone with way too much hope and not enough common sense. Yeah, like it's that it's that gambler's mentality of like, oh, I just need a I need a hot streak. I just need a few hands. I gotta like I gotta keep going. It's like even by nineteen like early nineteen hundred standards, having two dollars and fifty cents isn't gonna get you very far off the boat. It will not. Ponzi would work a great many jobs before settling into a position at a bank uh, in Montreal called Banco Zarosi. It was here that he first saw the pieces of a, of a Ponzi scheme. The bank was growing rapidly because it offered a 6% rate of return, double what banks offered at the time. As the bank started to fold, Ponzi would end up writing himself a check for $428 and forging a signature for one of the bank's officers. It didn't take long for Ponzi to get caught, and he would spend the next several years in prison. Can we go back over this little factoid? Because this is not something that I would have known. You're saying that Ponzi got the idea for the Ponzi scheme from someone else who was doing it, but in much more of a low-key way? Yeah, like, uh, before then, it was just called, like, a Peter to Paul scheme. Like, you rob Peter to pay Paul. And, like, as he did it so well that they just decided that it would be a lot easier to say Ponzi instead of Peter to Paul. Fair enough. So he, like, literally changed the definition. I, I think by 1950, the definition of Ponzi had been added to most dictionaries. Okay. Banks at this time kind of had a rule of threes. You gave 3% interest for investments, you earned 3% on top of that by charging 6% uh, for your loans, and then you were off at 3 p.m. to go play golf. Like, it was a very standard system, and bankers like it boring. So they were, they were content to keep it at those levels, and Banco Zorosi, which was headed by Zorosi, ended up just getting a little bit greedy with that and went too fast. He was actually solvent for a while. But it wasn't until there was uh, some real estate deals that fell through where he had to start paying off those deals with depositors' money that it turned into a Ponzi scheme. Okay. Yeah, while he was in jail, uh, he would come up with several more business ventures that would fail. Upon his release, he would go to jail for more than a year for trying to uh, smuggle some Italian immigrants from the U.S. into Canada. At this point, he would finally get back to Boston once he was released, and uh, he would start looking for his next big scheme. Ponzi wanted to make a guide on international currency speculation. He'd had some conversations with people while he was in prison on how you could buy currencies at lower rates and wait for them to appreciate and then resell them back. And he thought that this was a way that he could actually make some good money. And he wanted to make a giant trade book based on this. I like the fact that this guy who had committed some kind of bank fraud went to prison, learned more bank fraud-ish stuff, and came back out with new knowledge. That's I mean, that's awesome. A- 
that's pretty much prison. It's like you go to prison and instead of being rehabilitated, a lot of people just learn how to get away with it better. Yep. <laughs> but uh, with uh, with this sort of uh, speculation, he like he wanted to make the essential guide that everybody would use from then on, and he thought that that would make his his millions. That he would basically sign people up for his, uh, his subscription service where he would send them a new one every year. And while he was doing that, he ended up getting a international reply coupon from a, a bank in Spain, and he had never seen one of these before. Basically, at the time, postage was a little bit sketchy. Like, if you wanted to send a letter to somebody in France, you usually had to send, I, uh, you usually had to send money in that so that the person could buy stamps over there as well as the American stamps and get everything, and it made it so that you had to go through like three or four steps to make sure that your letter got to the right place. The Postal Union ended up making what are called international reply coupons. And if you had one of these, it basically covered all of that. Like, you didn't have to worry about it going through different countries. Like, that postage was just taken care of, and it would make it to wherever you wanted it to go. And one of the interesting things about that is they were all exactly the same price, and it was a fixed price. So after World War I happened, and a lot of currencies in Europe just took a dive, these coupons were still worth, uh, like, whatever they were in American dollars. But if you were in Italy, say, and their currency had dropped, and it used to be 10 lira to buy one of these, and now it's 500, you could buy those stamp coupons, bring them back to the U.S., and they would work just fine because they worked in any of these countries. So oh, Ponzi figured that he would go and get these coupons, and whenever he'd bring them back, he'd find businesses that relied on a lot of postage and sell them at a markdown so that everybody could save money and it wasn't technically illegal. So this is akin to, let's say, if gold bars back in the day, someone had set up a bunch of gold bars and they had priced them at $100 a bar. And let's just say hypothetically back then it made sense. But then either inflation happened or something happened to the economy where gold got a lot more valuable. But legally, you could not charge more than $100 for these gold bars. Essentially. Okay. Okay. Like, so it was just, it. it was a, it was a fixed rate, but in the other countries, like say that that gold thing happened and you were in a country where the dollar appreciated a ton and you could get that gold, uh, for way cheaper. So like, that's, that's essentially what we're looking at here. And while I was reading this book, it was like, that's not the worst idea I've ever heard. Like that sounds like something that could full on go legit. Yeah. I mean, he did find a real loophole here. I'm sure it's not going to last forever, but if you can find this and get in on it before they shut the loophole or they stop having any of these international reply coupons available in those countries where they're super cheap now compared to everywhere else, I think you're doing good business. Yeah. So in January of 1920, opened the Securities Exchange Company and started selling the first of the Ponzi notes. The first month he collected around $1,800. By June, he had $2.5 million in his business. And by July, he was earning $1 million per week. Nice. So, like, this, he was just starting to stack money on money because people were actually seeing these returns get fully paid out, and it seemed very legit to people on the street. A lot of times at this time, like, people had these uh, get-rich-quick schemes, and people would put a bunch of money in at first, and then the person would just disappear. The main difference between what Ponzi did is he actually had this capital to pay people out so that he could keep getting more money coming in. I also wanted to, I just did a quick little Google, Tony, and Securities and Exchange rung a bell in my mind. Securities yeah, and SEC. Exchange Commission is a real thing. They weren't formed, though, until 1934. Ponzi had a jump on them. In the yeah, Navy so I, I kind of wondered if there was a, if they picked that particular acronym because it was kind of a counter to Ponzi. Because you're talking about, like, one of the biggest scams that, that the country had ever seen in the ex Securities Exchange Company. And then the regulatory agency ends up being called, like, the ex Securities and Exchange Commission. That is So it has the exact same idea. three letters. I, didn't... I wasn't able to find if that was it, but, I mean, it might just be because they needed security exchange. So Lawmakers are always looking for some snarky name for their thing anyway. True. Some guy recently named his bill with the acronyms of the word Kavifi. <laughs> which I thought was pretty great. That doesn't need to go in the episode. We can continue on. We'll see. <laughs> At this point, Ponzi actually became a hero in Boston. 
He was a man claiming to be of the people. He was just like them. He had started out poor and then just built his way into something amazing. And he was trying to show that the banks had been stiffing people for so long with their like their 3% interest rate. And any time somebody tried to counter him, he basically said it was the, the banks having sour grapes because they couldn't be as successful as he was. Like, uh, he was a very sharp-dressed man, always smiling, always hyper-charismatic. He's the type of guy that basically could charm anyone. Any place he walked into, he was the one holding court. He was the one telling stories. He was the one getting all the attention, and he endeared himself to all these different people, and that's part of the reason why he was such a good salesman for it. It's hard to explain how popular he actually was. Several news articles had bolstered him up, uh, basically showing that he, that he was the quintessential American dream. Like... It got to the point where they posted a picture of his mansion. People found out where it was, and it was at, like it was a weekend destination just to drive by his mansion and see his locomotion car, uh, locomobile is what it was called, something like that. And they, it's kind of a cool looking limousine, but it was basically like thirteen thousand dollars back in the day. I'm not sure what that uh, rate is, but I know it'd be several hundred thousand now. And like he was a man who also had was a very very gratuitous spender like if he wasn't buying something big every week he felt like he was kind of losing out and i i'm guessing that's because he knew that this was only going to be a temporary thing there was no way it could keep going yeah, if you have the but, money people can come and ask for it back if you have a locomobile yeah <laughs> well they might not be able to take that from you yeah definitely Locomobile, by the way, for those of you who are wondering, as I was, uh, is like a car, but it doesn't have a steering wheel. Sort of like a cross between a. It was. It's essentially a buggy, without it, it, the a horseless carriage with a tiller. You you're looking at the older ones. Oh, like yeah? uh, there were some really nicer ones that were made uh, after this point. Okay. That just look like kind of they've got that that really 20s style, but they're very long and cool looking cars. With the useful ability, in the British's eyes at least, of being able to brew a cup of tea by tapping the boiler. <laughs> That's off topic. So British. <laughs> it is pretty hardcore, though. It's just like, oh, I got a little extra hot oil from the tank. We're going to make some beverage with it. <laughs> While all of this was happening, the postmasters in Boston and around the country, because uh, Ponzi had actually asked them directly if it was legal to do this, they basically told him, no, we're not going to just take these coupons and give you cash for them. And they also said there's only about $200,000 worth of these coupons in existence in America and less than that in most other countries. At the point he was working for, uh, at the point he was running his scam for, there would have had to be $160 million worth of these coupons. And there just simply wasn't. So the postmaster was starting to get in contact with people in regulatory agencies, and they were trying to get this exposed. But people wanted to believe so bad that they could just fix their money troubles with this. They sort of turned a blind eye to it. The only one that was really going after Ponzi was Robert Grozier of the Boston Post. Now tell us more about this guy. Robert Grozier ran the Boston Post. He was the son of the owner of the Boston Post who had won a Pulitzer Prize for some of his reporting. It was known for being the top paper in Boston. There were a lot of papers, and actually they shared a street office with uh, with Ponzi, like they were two doors down, something like that. And they constantly saw these crowds outside, and they decided they were going to see if this was actually legit. And it just it didn't smell right to Robert Grozier, so he started digging deeper and deeper. He went so far as to actually dispatch uh, reporters to Montreal, because there, like Ponzi was a man who loved to tell you his entire life story. But people started noticing that there was about a 10-year gap that he wouldn't talk about. The only thing that they could get out of him that he had been uh, in Canada at the time. So they ended up dispatching a few reporters with pictures of Ponzi to go check things out. They uncovered that he had been involved in bank fraud and actually had gone to prison for it for several years. That actually came a little bit later. The thing that really started getting people looking at Ponzi as a possible scam was a man named Clarence Barron. Barron is the one who owns the Dow Jones, uh, various other businesses. Like, he was a very, very successful investor. He ran a little telegram that was kind of essential reading. He also ended up buying the Wall Street Journal. And his little telegram was something that he, people had to pay a dollar a day for, which was absolutely insane. But it was the best investing advice, and it was mostly for the top-tier bankers. So they were willing to pay that sort of premium to get this guy's information. The Post had Barron look at Ponzi's uh, financials, at least what they could find out about it, and Barron said that there's no way that it was not a fraud. 
like absolutely no way that it could be legit. And this actually got uh, the state of Massachusetts and some other regulatory agencies to start looking into it. Just as another side note, I didn't realize that Dow Jones was something somebody owned, but it it totally is. Yep. Well, the Dow Jones Industrial Average is just like showing you like the I think it's the top 100 companies in the world, but Dow Jones Industrial Products is actually a company. Fair enough. In an effort to convince the Massachusetts state government he was on the level, Ponzi stopped taking deposits and allowed himself to be audited. The bookkeeping was sloppy and complicated and it slowed down investigators immensely. Meanwhile, suspicions of Ponzi's insolvency kept growing. Hundreds of people every day redeemed their Ponzi notes, often before they had a chance to mature. On the first day that Barron actually declared that it had to be a scam, more than $2 million were withdrawn from uh, from the securities exchange company. Ouch. So, And this is, just for people, I mean, this is bad even if you're a legit institution. Like, banks can't take it if everybody withdraws their money that's yeah, called a like, run you'll you'll it'll be bad for the bank yeah and ponzi survived the first run he had liquid assets of about eight million dollars from what people estimated at the time uh, spread across various other banks most of his money was actually kept at the hanover bank which he bought that bank completely out of spite because they turned him down whenever he asked for like a 200 hundred dollar loan at one point And he basically walked in there and bought the controlling shares just to spite this bank. And he kept most of his money there at the time. For a half a second, I was on this guy's side again. I I know that he probably ruined some people's lives, and that sucks. But that was a boss move. (laughs) Yeah, that's a a Batman move. (laughs) Still not like he walked... Yeah, he walked into the Hanover Bank and Trust, bought the controlling interest, and basically took over there and started using that as a place to to keep a lot of his money. And he kept it under various accounts that were kind of combinations of his wife and his mother's name, just trying to, like, spread money out a little bit. He also bought controlling interest in a lot of other banks. And whenever he was starting to have these financial troubles, he went to he went to several banks, like, a, I think it was called Frontier, and he pulled out his, like, $600,000 and they were trying desperately not to because the bank immediately busted after that. So he broke another bank with one of his runs on them. A lot of people don't know this about banks, but banks are allowed to uh, loan out the money that you give them nine times. Like, it's for every dollar they get, they can loan out nine. So in order to give mortgages, to give loans to businesses, all that sort of stuff, they have to have a high baseline. And if they have too many liabilities and people draw too much cash, that can completely ruin a bank. I did not know that. That's an interesting insight into the banking industry, Tony. Yeah, and uh, part of the financial crisis that we went through in 2008, banks were loaning out 18 to 21 times for every dollar, going against what was legal, which is nine times. And it's still crazy to me that you can loan a single dollar out nine times. At the same time, I assume. Like, it doesn't, it doesn't make sense to me. But, like, Bank of America, I think, was at, like, 18 times, things like that. So th- that's the reason why there was more regulation put in place after the 2008 bubble. And as, like as he stopped taking these notes, people were starting to panic a little bit. The lines were so long that it was like they had to have Pinkertons come in and actually keep the peace along with police officers. And there were scalpers outside in this 90, 90 degree heat as people were waiting hours and hours and hours for a chance to redeem their money. And they would buy the coupons for 90% value, 80% value. The, the worse the news got about Ponzi, the lower it dropped. There were people just trying to make sure that they got anything back. And uh, some of them actually thought that Ponzi was on the level. They didn't think that he would open himself to being audited if he wasn't. They thought that like all the stuff that he was saying was completely true. And they would go, and one guy in particular bought about $7,000 of these notes just to make sure that they would mature on time and that he would get it because people didn't want to wait in line and they didn't know if there'd be money by the time they got to the front of the line. I have to say, in this guy's defense, and you mentioned this earlier, a lesser man or a man maybe with fewer roots in the community would have taken as much of this as possible and as soon as things started to go south would have bounced out of town. He yeah. gave these refunds for as long as he still had money yeah and part of that was he he had ambitions of doing of going legit like whenever he started he thought he would go legit with the coupons and he would put this money out there when that didn't work like he decided that he had to do the ponzi scheme thing at this point he thought that he was going to be able to raise enough money to buy a bunch of steamships that were left over from world war one and his goal was to become a shipping magnate like he wanted to be 
like the guy in America that was running like shipping between Europe, like uh, between Europe and the Americas. He thought that he would be able to do that based on the investments. And he actually had what looked like a decent business plan. If he would have had maybe another six months here, he might have actually been able to go legit. And he would have gotten away with it, too, if it hadn't been for you meddling newspaper men. (laughs) Pretty much. And so, like, that that was his big goal. And um, I can never tell if this is, like, sociopathic tendencies where he's got such high delusions of grandeur that he thought no matter what he could make it work or if he was truly trying to scam people. Apparently, on his, like, deathbed confession, he said that he was just playing with other people's money. But, like, that hasn't been that well confirmed. I think that he just thought he was that good of a businessman, especially with how he handled himself and everything else, that he always thought he could talk his way out and get through everything. Oh, well. That didn't work out for him. At this point, he was being interviewed by reporters every day. Like, every day they met at 2 o'clock, and he would go out there, he would be his charming self, always smiling ear to ear, very easygoing. And, like, uh, he would make fun of the newspapers like The Post because all the other newspapers were kind of trying to scalp a little bit of uh, business from The Post. So they were actually propping Ponzi up while almost every day there were headlines going against uh, Ponzi's insolvency from the post. It was kind of an interesting thing where they like where these papers wanted a cut, so they were trying to go with the, uh, with the people that wanted to support him. At this point, things only got worse when the SEC's PR man, McMasters, went to the Boston Post with documents showing that Ponzi was in fact a fraud. Oh, stabbed Even in after- the back, McMasters! Yeah, McMasters was also, like, Calvin Coolidge's, like, PR guy, like, all these others, so he was a very well-popular, known guy, and he only worked with Ponzi for, like, a couple weeks before, like, taking these uh, these papers straight to the Boston Post. McMasters. Even after printing these allegations, Why? people wanted to believe. Amidst the panic masses trying to get their money, there were still throngs of people trying to get into the door to invest. They were bringing cash in and being turned away. Which still surprises me. Like, I know he's in the middle of an audit, but you'd think him knowing that there's a, a very limited timeline here, you'd think he'd have found a way to let people, like, invest so he could keep it going for just a little bit longer. Yeah. People want... Well, I... People want to believe in a thing like this. I mean, if I heard about it, like, I would want to, but I would hope that I'd have enough common sense to know that it's just a scam. Like, if something's too good to be true, it very rarely is. If it's too good to be true, it is, usually, I think is what you Yeah. Mean. Yeah, I, I, I heard that there was an interesting podcast I listened to. I think it was uh, Tell Me Something I Don't Know, where the, there was an audience, and the gentleman asked the audience a question. He said, ask them about three different types of investments. One of them was high risk, high reward, right, potentially. The other one was low risk, but low interest rate. And the other one was high return, low risk. And everybody took the high return, low risk ones, like 10% per year with, you know, very little risk of losing your money. And he says, well, you guys all just fell for a Ponzi scheme because that doesn't exist. (laughs) You cannot get that. You all know that that doesn't exist, but you still pick the bad one. Yeah, pretty much. And that's uh, like, unless there's actual drug money being involved, you're not going to get those sorts of like rates of return. Yep. I mean, investment can can be fabulously fabulously profitable but hey, there's no guarantee yeah it's, it's like the people who invested early in amazon like they definitely got their payments and everything but that's that's much more but there's rare. some other new thing that started up this week that is going to ask somebody for money and who knows what they're going to turn into probably nothing and those guys are going to lose their shirts patreon.com slash human echoes <laughs> that hit a little too close to home tony <laughs> but yes do chip in uh, there. Anyway. <laughs> That's not an investment. You're just giving us money. <laughs> that's true. There is no return on that other than entertainment. And really, that's what this is and all about. And good God, feelings. Yes, good feelings. <laughs> in order to pay off these debts, Ponzi had to go to some hidden accounts at various banks, and he bounced a few checks. Oh, no. On August 11th, it came crashing down for Ponzi. First, the Post came out with a front-page story about his activities in Montreal 13 years earlier including forgery, his forgery conviction and Zarkozy's scandal-ridden bank. It also had pictures of his, uh, of his mugshots, like both mugshots, right on the front page. 
That's that good. afternoon, also, Bank Commissioner Allen seized Hanover Trust due to numerous irregularities. The commissioner thus inadvertently foiled Ponzi's pay- plan to borrow funds from the bank vaults as a last resort in the event all other efforts to ad- obtain funds failed. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention that he was planning to rob the bank that he owned so that he could show them that there were liquid assets at his uh, at his other business. Like, physically go in there with, like, a mask and, like, hold the place I, up? I think he was planning on doing it, like, after hours and giving people, like, excuses to go home and everything. So it'd be... I guess it. I guess it's easier to rob the bank when you have the key. Yeah, yeah, but it's still it's still a huge problem, and there were so many things that could go wrong with it. But he had planned to bring three or four million dollars in cash from that bank to his uh, to his shop to show that he actually had the money to pay these people off. And at this point, uh, Alan, the bank commissioner, basically shut down that entire bank and seized its assets or froze its assets until they were later seized. So why doesn't this work, Tony? <laughs> Why is this a bad idea as if we needed to be told? Oh, this is one of the clearer bad ideas we've ever had. Like it, it's essentially just theft in a mess in a way that's not sustainable. Like it's bad enough to steal things. It's worse to get people to invest their life savings and give them hope of like an excellent return and then just take the money from them. Yeah, I was going to say like, for for Ponzi, this was just a crime. I mean, crime might be a bad idea sort of in general, but getting something for nothing is, and, and take it, if you're willing to take it from people, that's, that's just immoral. The bad, the real bad idea here is from the people who invested and kept investing and kept investing. Yeah. It's like whenever you've got like a finite pool of resources and like, you just keep on thinking that it's just going to keep coming back and keep coming back. Like. It just doesn't make sense that you could make that much, especially because Ponzi never revealed who was buying these coupons. He kept using that uh, whole, like, oh, I'm selling these coupons, the IRC coupons, over and over and over again. But they never once had evidence that he ever sold any. He had boxes of them lying around, which was, like, to, to convince regulators that he actually was legit about it. But, they like, he never once was able to find a buyer because people didn't care that much about saving a few cents on postage. <laughs> That's uh, that's funny. <laughs> like I feel like if you if he would have done it right, and he just did it for himself, he might have eventually been able to find a postal buyer and like just get a few thousand dollars here, a few thousand dollars there, and maybe work into another company. But his dreams were just a little bit too lofty, and it kept him from being able to do anything reasonable. Everything just kind of spiraled out of control, and he lived the high life for about eight months. And like that was it. He didn't. He didn't get to Bernie Madoff it, where he lived an entire life like as a billionaire. Still, eight months is probably better than most of us are gonna get. Yeah, and like after this, he ended up going to prison for like three and a half years, and then did another stint because the state of Massachusetts waited for him to get out before tagging him with their larceny charges. He didn't have a very good life after this point. There was a time where he moved to Florida and was trying to give people two hundred percent return on their investment because he was so desperate for startup money. And people just kind of saw through it this time. A 200%. Yeah, I would. I... <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's like that's that's higher than loan shark rates. That's bad. Yeah. Like basically he was just trying to buy like an acre of land or thousands of acres of land in like Swamp Road in Jacksonville, like the bad parts of the swamps and was planning to turn it into like 10 houses per acre and just all this other stuff. And it was it was a very ill-conceived plan and he was just getting desperate. Eventually, he would get deported. He went back to Italy, and then I uh, worked for an airline for a little bit. Ended up in Brazil, and kind of died alone down there. So, uh, you've talked extensively about this. You mentioned that you'd read a book. Uh, is there more extended reading people could do on this topic if they're interested? There's a lot of different books that are out there on Ponzi. He even put out his own autobiography. I'm not a hundred percent sure. I, if that's worth reading, it might be fascinating to get his take on everything. It's just called The Rise of Ponzi, and it was written in his 50s after he had fallen terribly. So it, w- it would be interesting to see his perspective on it. The book that I ended up reading was Ponzi's Scheme, The True Story of a Financial Legend by Mitchell Zukoff. There are several books on this topic, but that's the one that I read. Some people might find parts of it kind of dry, but I'm always intrigued by like this sort of like and that it got worse type situation. So it was it was a really fascinating book. Like I did it on Audible, so it was about twelve hours, something like that. Decent sized book, and yeah, I would recommend checking this out. 
if you want to read like one that'll make you very very sad read books on bernie madoff but ponzi just because he had so much moxie and because it only lasted for so long it's a little bit more interesting a little more palatable it won't bring you down quite so bad we hope. yeah his his investments would have been today's equivalent of 225 million dollars instead of like 20 billion ouch yeah anyway thank you guys for listening to this i uh, this episode of bad ideas we will see you next week. If you enjoyed this, check out our Patreon page, patreon.com slash human echoes. Become a member and you get access to all sorts of things like the bonus podcast. You get videos early, all sorts of fun stuff. And we will see you guys next week. Bye-o!